Good morning and welcome to the First Baptist Church of Florence Sunday School lesson. And we are still teaching from the book of Ecclesiastes that we started last week. Now the book of Ecclesiastes is a book that was written by King Solomon. Solomon has finished the building of the temple that his father had ordered him to do and that God gave him to do. And he is now later in life and he is sitting around and he's beginning to think like a lot of us do when we have time on our hands about what is the meaning of life and why all of these things do we do down here and why do we have to go through those. His term for everyday life is under the sun. And he uses that quite frequently in the book. And in last week's lesson that we studied, he came to a conclusion about life. And the conclusion that he came is this, that life without God is absolutely useless and absolutely petty or vain or empty. Because if a man lives a hundred years in this life, but he never finds God nor knows God and he dies and ends up in hell, then the problem is this. You've, it's a wasted life. All of those years and you're going to leave everything Solomon said to someone else and you yourself are going to be lost eternally. So life without God is a useless life. And he also saw life as a drudgery without God. It's a drudgery to be endured. Now, if you're the kind of person who is enduring life, life just, just doesn't have any meaning for you and you are enduring life, then you've got the wrong attitude or you've got the wrong things in your life. Maybe you need to try something like praying, reading your Bible, studying Scripture, and getting closer to God. Because God is the real meaning of life. And life is not something that is to be endured or at best walked through. Life is something that we can go through joyfully, peacefully, if we keep Jesus Christ in our hearts. And I understand that when we're all young, we weren't saved, and we've all done things we've regretted. But God has put those all behind us and forgiven us and will never be remembered against us anymore. And since the day God saved us, we should be living a life of joy and happiness. Yeah, there will be struggles. Yes, there will be problems. But still, Jesus Christ and God the Father are there to go through us with Him. Now, in our lesson today... Solomon has been watching other people. And Solomon has been following and just observing. And so what he finds is that there are seasons in life. And the seasons come and the seasons go. Now we're not talking about the seasons of summer, winter, fall, and summer. We're talking about seasons of life. And there's some things we need to understand about the seasons of life. Sometimes the seasons of life are very short. Not life itself, but the season that you're walking through. Sometimes the seasons of life seem endless. Lord, when is this going to end in my life? I, it's just continually going on and on and on. And then there are, <clears throat> uh, he realizes that uh, however, that God is in control of all of the seasons and all of the decisions, and he, de and, and he determines alone the seasons we walk through. God determines the seasons of life that we are in, how long they are going to last, and what we are to learn from them. So we have very little control over the seasons of life. Only God has been given that control. And we, there's not much we can do or say. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, Tom. If God loves me, why is he allowing this in my life? And I've got an answer for you. Two things. First of all, sometimes we don't know. Do you remember our study of the, of the book of Job? Job did not know. Job never understood why he had to go through all of that. 
But God allowed it because God was proving a point to Satan that men will, learn, will serve God because they love God, not because they're forced to, or not because they're blessed. They love God simply because they love God. And so God determines seasons. And you must understand the seasons really are there to help us. Sometimes they stretch us. Sometimes they call us into a closer relationship with God. Sometimes they show us our total dependency on God, that without God we would have nobody. And so Solomon in his observations has been noticing that. And he also realizes one other thing, and this is important too. There is nothing we can do in this life to change or to stop the seasons. The seasons are coming to us all. Some of the seasons that he doesn't even mention, but we've, a lot of us have gone through our early youth, middle age, older, and then the last season that we'll go through is the season of death. And he mentions that in the lesson today. So he has been talking and he has been observing people. And, and the person that is without God is always searching for something to bring happiness into their life or to get happiness into their life and joy. People try many things to get away from life, if life is tough, or to bring joy or happiness into their life. But the thing that they're missing is it's not things that's going to bring us joy and happiness and peace through all of the seasons of life. It is God. And so the people in this world turn to many different things, and we all know this. Some go to drinking to the excess, and the drinking is just to escape the reality of life. Others turn to drugs for the same reason. Um, I have a son that works in an emergency room at the hospital. And where states have uh, passed this uh, smoking of marijuana, now they are beginning to see repercussions from that. And they are people that are coming into the emergency room and their lives have been destroyed by the simple drug, marijuana, that everybody says, oh, it doesn't hurt to smoke it but there are beginning to be repercussions. And then uh, he goes on and he talks about they look for thrills, but the thrills only last for a short while. Or they, they fall into depression. I mean, to, you talk to people today, and I've never seen so many people on depression drugs today. And I know... I'm not a doctor, and I don't understand it all, and I, I know that sometimes uh, chemical imbalances in the body can go astray, astray, but I also know that sometimes people fall into depression because they just don't like life anymore. They're, they don't see any use in life, and that's where Solomon himself got. He got into despair over human life in last week's lesson. Or sometimes illnesses beset. They don't eat properly, they don't sleep properly, and then the next thing you know, an illness comes along and grabs them. Or they even go into withdrawing from life. Just, I'll just withdraw from life. If I don't go outside the door of my house, and then there's nothing that can bother me or hurt me or get to me. But that itself is a real problem. Because you see, they forget one thing. Loneliness can kill you. And that's what they're doing, shutting himself off from the world. So let's begin the lesson today, and let's look at what Solomon says about the seasons of life that come and that they go. So he starts off in verse 1 of chapter 3, and he says, There is an occasion for everything, and a time for every activity under heavens. So first of all, he says there's an occasion. Even if we don't want the occasion... It still comes. There is an occasion for everything. Everybody don't want to die, but there is a season of death for all of us in this life. And so he says there's an occasion for every single thing under heaven. 
in this life. There is an occasion. And he goes on and he says, and there is a time for every activity under heaven. There are times when we, are, when we have to do certain activities. We may not want to. We may not like to. But it does not matter. We still have to do that. And though some of those activities are difficult to do. And so Solomon says, but there is a time and a season for every activity under heaven. Solomon reminds us that we all go through seasons of life. And it's just life. And we cannot change the seasons. And then he starts in verses 2 through 4, listing the seasons. A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. So he starts off with the two very basic things that we all need to understand about life. Life has a beginning. That's when we are created in our mother's womb. Life begins, and then when we are born, our life in this world begins. And everybody has to have a birth. None of us got here any other way. We all have had mothers, and the mothers gave birth. And so, that is the beginning of life here. But then he says there also is a time to die. And d death is the other end of the bookshelf, if you will. Because death comes to all. Nobody escapes it. Some live short lives. Some live long lives. But bottom line is all are born and all are going to die. That is a season of life. And honestly, if most people will take the time to look at it, there are people who die suddenly, yes. But most of us die uh, uh, in a process. Being born is a process, but dying is a process. Do you know why insurance companies love to sell you accidental death pro uh, uh, policies? Because they know that the chances of your dying in an accident are very slim. Most people die of a disease, and they die over a process. It's a process of time. And that's why the insurance companies are very careful about the kind of policies that they write for us. And then he says, there's a time to plant. Yep, there's a time to begin to grow. If somebody doesn't grow food in this world, none of us will eat. So there's a time to plant. But he says there's a time to uproot. There's a time to harvest. There, you, you plant your crops in the ground. You gather the fruit off of them. And then you've got to pluck up or plow under that, other, uh, that, that is left from the food that it has produced. So there is a time to plant and there's a time to uproot. And then he says this. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. Wow. A time to kill? That's war. Wars come in this life. We have no control over them within ourselves. I'm a king. I've got a, I own this nation. I control this nation. That's not enough for me. I want that other nation too. So I start a war. And people die in war. And one key thing I want to mention about all of this is this. Death is not the end of all things. There is a time we will die physically in this world. But we don't stop living. We go to either heaven or hell depending on whether we're saved or lost. And we will live forever. We're going to live forever in one place or another. But this body is going to pass away. It's our decision to make where we want to be in eternity. And then he goes on and he says, So there is also a time to heal. There's a time to bind up the wounds. Some of us get hurt in accidents or whatever, and we have to go through the healing process. Now, some, God sometimes intervenes and does miraculous healing, and I understand and get that. But the natural way of this life is if you get hurt, 
it takes time for you to heal. And that is why God has given us hospitals and doctors and people that can work to help us to heal. So there is a time to heal, and there's a time to heal, and a nation needs to heal. Our nation today needs healing. But it doesn't need anything but God to heal it. But that's something we do not want in our nation at this time. And then he says, there is a time to tear down, and there is a time to build. Even houses, even living places, have a time when they need to be torn down. They're old, everything's worn out in them, they have served their purpose, and there's a time to tear down. But then there's also a time to rebuild, build new homes, build new buildings, build different things. Uh, in the land of Israel, the, the rocks are very plentiful. There are rocks everywhere in that nation. I never saw a more rocky place in my life. And so armies in the, uh, in the Old Testament, a lot of times, when they would conquer a land to keep it from being used, they would move in and they would sow it in salt or they would sow it with stones. They would just gather stones from everywhere and pile them up to make the place useless again. So there is a time to tear down. There is a time to build back up. Notice these seasons. They are opposites of each other in every case, but each of them come in their own time. Then he goes on and he says, there's a time to weep. And there's a time to laugh. We don't go to funerals and sit there in the service and laugh. We weep because we've lost someone dear to us or a good friend or whatever. But on the other hand, we don't go to a party and cry. We go to have fun and to laugh and enjoy our friends and families. And so there's both a time to weep and a time to, to laugh. They're, they are at opposite ends of the scale again, but they do come, each one in their own time. And then he says, there is a time to mourn. When you bury your loved one, you mourn. And there is a time to dance. There's a time that you can have fun and you dance. And my wife and I, my wife was an English teacher and I owned a business. And we used to be uh, one of the couples that they would ask to uh, help and sponsor the um, uh, proms that they had at her school. And my wife and I loved to dance. I know Baptists aren't supposed to dance, but my wife and I love to dance. And so my wife and I would go to the proms and we would dress up like the other kids and we would dance. And uh, uh, some of the kids saw, would come to my, her at school later and say, wow, you and your husband, we saw you dancing at the prom. Yeah, we enjoy it. There's a time to mourn, but there's also a time to dance. And so he talks about all of these. And he t one of the things that we want, need to notice is in all of these things, is that we don't have any control. They are set by God. God determines who's going to be born and when. God determines who's going to die and when. God determines the times in your life when things happen that you need to weep over and when times in your life when you need to laugh and rejoice. And all of these seasons come into every life. There's a time to plant. There's a time to harvest what's planted. And so God sets these seasons and they're part of life. And Solomon has been seeing this in the lives of all these people that he's been watching. One is in a season of joy. Another is in a season of mourning. One is in a season of just being born. One is in a season of dying. And he, he names all of these. One is tearing down to remodel, and another is building new. But all of us are going in through all of these seasons of life, and they come to each of us at different times, in different ways, 
but they're all seasons of life that we pass through. And so Solomon looks at all of that. And then he continues in verse 5 to 8. There's a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. Sorry. A time to embrace and a time to avoid embracing. A time to search and a time to count as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Now, again, as I've already said, Israel is full of stones. And so what sometimes they would gather these stones that were laying around, they were a building material, and they would build their homes and their walls and their fences and stuff out of stone. First of all, we need to understand this. Israel learned to be stone cutters when they were down in Egypt. They built Egyptian cities. So they know how to take stones and make beautiful homes out of them. And so they would, they would sometimes gather stones to build from. But then there are times to throw stones. Let me give you an example. David and Goliath. David picked up five stones when he went to fight Goliath. He threw one stone at Goliath and killed him. Why did he have four others? Because if you read the Bible and study it, Goliath had four brothers. David did not know, will, will I have to kill them all? Are they all in the army of the Assyrians, or is it just Goliath? And so there's a time to throw stones, and there's a time to gather stones. Then he said there's a time to embrace, and a time to avoid embracing. There is a time to comfort someone. There is a time to put your arms around someone and say, Hey, you're loved. We need you. So there is a time to embrace. But then there is also a time to avoid embracing. You have to be very careful. I mean, you never know in this world today that we are living in that there's times that we need to avoid embracing. I'm an older man. I have to be careful if I embrace a young lady because of how it could look in the eyes of the world today. And so there's a time to embrace and there's a time to avoid embracing. And those are seasons of life. There's a time to get married and embrace your wife. But there's also times that we don't need to be embracing. And then he goes on and he says, And there is a time to search. There's a time to look for something that you've lost. And I find as I'm getting older, that becomes more and more important in my life. Sometimes I have to search for my car keys. Sometimes I have to search for my wallet. It's just part of life. It's a season of life. When I was younger, I knew where I had it all. Today I'm older. Sometimes I'll ask my wife, where, did you see where I put my car keys? And so there's a time that we have to look for things. And there is a time to count as law. Sometimes you just never find what you're looking for. And you look, and you look, and you look, and you look, and you can't find it. So finally, you just have to give up and say, look, it's just lost. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know where it's gone. I don't know what I, don't know what I did with it. And that does happen too. And then there's a time to keep. Older people especially fall into this category in that older people try to keep everything. Let me tell you. And I guess it's not just the old, but you can't keep everything forever. There comes a time when things that you used to have are no longer useful. Let me give you just a little example from my life. I, am, uh, I have, uh, when I was younger, I, I earned an electrical degree. And so I can wire and I know how to do all of that. Well. I, I have rolls of wiring at my house, or had, 
that are wires that you use to run, like for speakers and all of that. But in today's world, everything is, is a wireless. That wire does me no good today, so I finally just threw it all away. There was a time to keep it, but there was a time to throw it away. Same thing with clothes. There's a time when you buy new clothes and you keep it and you wear it, but there's a day they wear out and you have to get rid of them. You have to throw away. So there is a season. Then he says there's a time to tear and a time to sow. Now in the, in the biblical days, in the Old Testament days especially, and even into the New Testament, when someone received bad news, one of the things they would do is they would grab their garment and they would pull it and tear it. And it was a sign of mourning to everyone around. But then when the morning was over, you couldn't run to the local dress shop and buy a, a piece of clothing in the days of the Bible so they would have to re-sew that which was torn. So there's a time to tear and there's a time to sew. My wife down through the years that we've been married has had to sew many buttons on my shirts. I, got a, I have a tendency to, to break them off and, and lose them and so there's a time to tear, there's a time to sow. And then he says, there is a time to be silent. Boy, this is a hard one for us all to obey. There are, our, our tendency today is to speak up. We've got to get our two cents in. We have to make everybody understand our point. But there's times when we can make our point. There's even times when you can tell the truth and cause great harm. So the wise man knows when to be quiet and when to speak. And that wisdom comes only from God. And then he says there is a time to love and a time to hate. Neighbors get into it with each other. They fall out. Property lines are disputed. Many, many things happen in this life. So there is a time to love. But then there is a time to hate. And you've all heard it. I've heard it. We've all heard it many times in our life. People say, I hate this, or I hate that, or I hate him, or I hate her. And it's part of life. And Jesus came to give us a new way of life. Jesus tells us not to hate, but to love. But still within our human flesh, sometimes we hate. And that's the truth. And sometimes God allows us to do that to teach us a very hard lesson. Because you know what? If you truly hate someone, and God tells you to go to the altar and pray for that person, that's a difficult thing to do. And if they hate you and you know it, and God says you go to that altar and you pray for them, because Jesus in the New Testament said, pray for your enemies. That makes it a very difficult thing, but there is a time to love and a time to hate. And he says there is a time of war. Wars come, we know that. We've seen them all of our lives in different countries. Our own nation has been involved in two world wars. And there is a time of peace. David was a warring man, and he fought many, many battles to, con to bring, be able to bring the nation of Israel together as one nation. He wanted to build a temple for God. God said, no, you've got too much blood on your hands. But I'll give your son Solomon a time of peace, and he will build my temple. So Solomon built a temple, and he had peace throughout all of his reign. And so you see there's a time of war and there's a time of peace. And all of us go through these seasons. And as I said in the beginning, some of them are long. Some of them are short. Sometimes we're going through a couple of seasons in the same time. But the bottom line is, God ordains the seasons. They come in all lives. And we have little control over them. And then in verses 9 through 11... Solomon changes the subject a little bit. And he goes back to what he talked about in the last, last week. Work. And he says in verse 9, What does the worker gain from his struggles? 
I have seen the task that God has given the children of Adam to keep them occupied. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He also put eternity in their hearts, but no one can discover the work of God, the work God has done, sorry, from the beginning to end. Now, he asked a question. I've seen all the workers and how they work and how, and how they have to struggle. And you know what? What do they gain? They gain a paycheck. They may own a few things. But as he said in last week's lesson, they die and leave it to somebody else and have no control over it. So why go out and struggle and work hard to have then? And then he says, is life really worth it without God? Because in the next, next section he says, I have seen the task that God has given the children of Adam to keep them occupied. I've seen all the work that God lets us do and God lets us walk through and it's to keep us occupied. I hear so many people in today's world who say, I hate my job. I hate getting up every morning going to work. Well, you see, that is, a, that is someone who has not made a full and complete surrender to God. Because when you love God, God will help you love what you do. I owned a couple of small companies in my lifetime, and I loved it. I loved my work. I enjoyed my work. And I don't ever remember a day when I got up and said, Oh, I, I hate doing this, because I loved it. But you know what made me love it? It was God. God gave me a new day every day to look forward to, that I might talk to someone about Christ. And I, you will not believe the number of people that I have prayed for on parking lots while I was there to get their order, praying for their children, praying for their wife or husband, praying for different things. And I tell you, you can love your work if... You allow God to be the king on the throne of your heart. And that's the clue. And then if you're doing something you don't like, then you need to ask God to give you into something that you do like. Now be careful when you ask that, because God may get you fired, but He will lead you to something that you really love later. But here's the key. We all have to walk through this life and we are given tasks to keep us busy but we should be busy doing the task of God not our task and th then he goes on and he says he has made everything appropriate in his time in reality it is appropriate for God to do that God, in His reality, has given us a part of us that should desire eternity. And He mentions that in the very next thing. So, in reality, it's appropriate to God for God to do this, give us these tasks. And the answer why is to prepare us for eternity. Down here, we are getting prepared for eternity. And He goes on and He says... He, put, he also put eternity in their hearts. I would, love, I would love to know what's going to take place in eternity. I have some ideas from the study of God's Word, and from, like the book of Revelations and, and other books of the New Testament, but I don't know it all and I don't understand it all. But I've got a part of me that God gave me when He saved me, and I have a great desire to be in eternity with Him. And that's the whole goal of my doing what I do on this earth. And I realize no one can discover all of the work that God has done from beginning to end. I'll be honest about it. I know about creation, but I don't understand it. How can God, and I praise Him for doing this, but how, God, how can God take nothing and make something from it? How can God say, let there be, and it exists? That is 
the power of God and I don't understand it and nobody on this earth totally understands that. They may claim they do, but they don't. And I know he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth and a new universe. But I don't understand how that's all going to happen. We will never understand, but we know that everything that God does is for our good. In verses 12 and 13, then he says, And I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and enjoy the good life. It is also the gift of God whenever anyone eats, drinks, and enjoys all of his efforts. Here's the key. The best we can hope for in this life is one of peace and happiness. And Solomon says there is nothing better than to rejoice and enjoy a good life. Don't look at life as a drudgery and something to be endured. Look at life every day as a new beginning and a new chance to witness or to lead or to teach or to preach or to do something to help people find Jesus Christ. And so a man can enjoy the good life. It is also the, God, the gift of God if we get to eat. Who gives us the food? God. Well, wait a minute. You say, I went to the store and bought it. Where did you get the money from my job? Where did you get the job? Well, I applied for it. Who helped you get the job? God. And then he said, and if you drink, it's from God. And there's nothing better than a good cold drink like iced tea or something on a very hot, humid day. And it's an enjoyment to have that. But God gives it to it. And it's, a, it, and it's a gift of God if we enjoy the good things of this earth. And we have to understand that. All those things are a gift of God. Everything that we have. Then he says this, verses 14 through 15. I know that everything that God does will last forever. There is no adding to or taking from it. God works so that people will be in awe of him. Whatever is has already been. And whatever will be already is. However, God seeks justice for the persecuted. Now that seems like a sentence out of place, but let's look at this. First of all, Solomon says we have to understand everything God does will last forever. God gives us eternal life. What's eternal life mean? Life forever with Him. God does eternal things. We do temporary or temporal things, but God does eternal things. And there is no adding or taking from it. I can't, I can't change the wind. I can't change the rotation of the earth. I can't change the fact that the earth rotates around the sun and has been doing all of that from the beginning. And I can't change things we got people today, I heard this the other day on news, we have a bunch of people that think the sun is too hot and they're going to try to come up with a way to block part of the sun from the earth. Can you believe that? God made the sun and God made the earth and he made it just the way it is and we're not going to be able to change it. But people think they can do that. How crazy can we be? And he said, God works so that people will be in awe of him. When you look at the universe... I know I'm getting a little long in the lesson here, but let me make you, uh, tell you a story. We had a little girl from China that came to visit us, and she worked for us for a while. And what, we took her on a, on a trip with some of our other friends, and we, we went in, up into the woods in northern West Virginia. And she is laying out on a bench in the yard, and night's coming, and all of a sudden she screams, and she sets up. Well, we thought something had happened to her. And she said... I see stars. Now this girl's in her mid-twenties anyway, and she had never seen the stars. And then she became aware of the stars whenever it was night and there were no lights around, and she was, she, it was unbelievable to her. And then she, when she was told that God created all of those, it just, it, wow, it awed her. God does things to all people. That's why you do see sometimes miraculous healings. It's to bring us in awe of God, to help us see the power and the, and the eternity and the knowledge and the wisdom of God. And then he goes on and says, Whatever is has already been. There's nothing new under the sun. We think we're smart. Listen, 
You go back and look at how they built the, the, the pyramids and all of those things. They did things we couldn't do today, even with all of our cranes. And so he says, uh, whatever is has already been, and whatever be is already, already is. We're not going to change our whole, uh, the, the existence of man upon this planet. Now, we may think we can, but God's got the seasons and the times and all of those things set, and we have no control. To my, matter of fact, we, we don't even have a control on whether we're going to live tomorrow or not. If God calls our name, we're gone. And then he says, however, God seeks justice for the persecuted. Wow. I mean, here we are talking about awe in God. But what he's trying to say is this. The awesome God who created everything and made everything and lives eternally and put eternity in our hearts cares about who is persecuted. Listen. Men make laws. Men persecute each other. But let me tell you, when Jesus Christ comes again, there is going to be justice for all. And I promise you, if you persecute, you will get a day of justice. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and thank you for this lesson. Thank you for all the love that you've shown us. Help us to understand, Lord, that there are seasons of life. And we can make one of two choices. We can either endure them or we can walk through them with you. Help us to make the wise and the right choice, I pray. Forgive us our sins. Help us to walk worthy of being called by your name. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us today. We will look forward to seeing you next week. May God bless you richly until next week. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.